Uh, welcome to a very impromptu Utsun lecture series. It is my great privilege to introduce Richard Rogers, who has flown from London this morning and will fly out tomorrow, quite a feat to come and give us a lecture tonight in a very busy day. I think Richard knows, uh, needs no introduction, of course. His impact and relevance for more than 40 years to architecture and to the design of cities has been extraordinary. The clarity of his design thinking and really as a benchmark to test ideas is, is remarkable. I can recall as a student when the Burberg was unveiled how challenging and fascinating and important it was as a building. And of course the crease started before then and went on to do many, many more things. His contribution to society, to the public debate, his sure generous touch it. spirit evidenced by his presence here at the University of New South Wales and of course his leadership in design in our city and the consequent legacy we will have will be very important for us at Barangaroo and in the city of Sydney. So Richard, thank you for coming. I have to also welcome and acknowledge the staff of Rogers Stoke Harbour, Harbour and Partners who are here, some of whom are here tonight, as well as many other distinguished guests from, from industry bodies, and from our partners. I have to acknowledge the New South Wales President of the Australian Institute of Architects and its members, the President of the Australian Institute of Landscape Architects, representatives of the city of Sydney, and also the National Vice President of the Australian Institute of Building and, of course, many people from Lend-Lease who are involved with Richard and his firm in Barangaroo. I also invite and welcome uh, Built Environment uh, Faculty Advisory Council members and the alumni and students who are here tonight. So, Richard, thank you very much. We look very much forward to hearing from you. Good evening. First, I must thank Alec especially and all of you for turning up very much on us for 24 for our notice. I was hoping to be in Sydney last week, but unfortunately I got bronchitis, and so I was only able to come for a meeting today and leave tomorrow for another meeting. Um, but it's fantastic that you are all here. I can't tell you how impressed I was just for the walk down the centre here, the spine. Um, the amount of vi people, the vitality of the area. I couldn't think of a university in Europe that has been built in the last 60 years that compares either in quality of design or in many ways in the way that people bump into people because of that quality of design. Of course, that's what I will be talking about, so I'm slightly biased. Um, I'm hoping very much, can you all hear me? Yeah? Good. I'm hoping very much that this will be not too formal, but rather a sort of give and take. And uh, at the end, I hope we'll have a more a lively dis discussion. I'm going to talk about cities, which I'm passionate about and have worked for many years, and of course, about design and architecture. Cities are the mark of society's civilization. I love the word cities, citizenship, civic pride, nearly all, everything. In fact, you could say all culture has come from cities. It's also, of course, cities that drive our economy and has, have always driven our economy since cities began in Mesopotamia some 6,000 years ago. In some ways, cities have changed less than we think. We still like to face the sun, we like to sit on the doorstep, we like to meet people, and that's what really cities are about, meeting of people. That's the one truly unique thing about cities. So it's how the political, but also how the physical and social parts come together that make successful cities throughout history. And we look back to Hellenic Athens, for instance, and we look at the public domain, or Rome, or in fact, to Egypt, if you like, and you see that division between public domain, and there's another of those phrases that I love because it means not only physical, but social. And again, urban design is about the physical relationship to the social, the social relationship to the, to the physical and the built environment. Now, let's see what I said. Uh -huh. So, about, talking about meeting of people, 
This is a wonderful painting by one of my very favorite painters, Masaccio, who with Brunelleschi went to Rome, Donatello, and Donatello, and in a sense rediscovered the tradition of the past of the Hellenic and Roman traditions. But I put this here because it's very much a symbol of what it is about, about seeing how people live, about not being able to hide from both the good and the bad. It's not about ghettoization, it's about a public place with private buildings enclosing it. This literally is the beginning of the Renaissance. So the public domain enhances the ability of people to meet. It creates places where we can be friendly. And we're talking about a period where cities are coming back after a ghastly period in terms of the Industrial Revolution. I say ghastly because it was so polluted where uh, the life expectancy of cities like Manchester and London in, uh, in, seven, in the 18th century, the end of the 18th century, was about uh, under 20 years old. Uh, anybody who can find a few cents, farthings, or whatever it was, would move out of cities to live a bit longer. So, then, of course, the car made it even easier. And now we're beginning to realize, not least with climate change, that cities and the compact city, which is what I'm going to be talking to you about, is the only environmentally sustainable form that we have. The compact, well-connected, live-work, poor, rich, well-designed, just city. This is Copenhagen. I'm sure that I got this image from Young Girls. Young Girls says he, I, he never gave it to me, but he's, he's lying. Um, but this is a typical Copenhagen sit, uh, street where you get that feeling of mix. I put this here because I think there's a, mis a misunderstanding about quantity. Public domain has many different uses. You need a, I can think of squares with one tree, especially in Paris, in fact not even a tree, with a bench and a bush, which is a space, it's a perfectly good public space. You can also think of spaces which are large, but you need different types of spaces for different activities. At times you want to go into a public space because you want to be lonely. At times you want to go there because it's a market, because it's full of life and vitality. And there's a myth about that every public space per se is good. I put this because Venice, which in many ways has, whilst it has no cars, has actually very little public space, apart from all the beautiful paths. It has some Marco, which is an explosion when you arrive there. There's some wonderful spaces around churches. But overall, it's about compactness and then explosion. And I have found as I work that there's nearly as much misunderstanding about the use of public space and the design of public space as there's a demand for public space or a lack of public space. So public space has to be designed. Pompidou Centre, when we did the Pompidou, Renzo Piano and I, together with Aero Varims in 1971, the first thing when we did that competition, we did was to look around the area and we decided that, that there was no open spaces for a long way. And we thought, therefore, we will give it a big square, a big public space there. Because there was this explosion between the small streets, mainly streets full of actually prostitutes, which brings the density up in here. So there was a, <laughs> and then, and there really was no other place to go to. So we created this big piazza. Later on, Leal was demolished and it took some of the sting out of Pompidou because Leal became, which is the old meat market, took some of the pressure out of Pompidou, made it a little bit less exciting. But this is really about what I love so much, which is people watching people. It's the greatest activity in the world. And the way that people form around people, whether it's a magician or whether it's a singer or whatever it may be, activities. And that, and I'll come back to this, that public space is not only horizontal, it's also vertical. In other words, it's the relationship. These are streets in the air, there's the Pompidou, there's one of the so-called streets, it's also the escalators, obviously steps historically, where there's the 
the Spanish steppes in Rome or wherever it is, historically have created a, th a third dimension to public space. And that's why, in a sense, I'm always saying you have to link architecture and planning, and I'll come back to that. Coming back to the whole civic concept, social responsibility, the belief that what we're doing is not only for ourselves, but to better the, the life and quality of life of people and cities. The famous Greek oath at the height of Greece, of Hellenic Greece, was, I will leave the city more beautiful than I entered it. There were only 2,000 white males, but there was the beginning of democracy. In some ways, it hasn't changed enough, but anyhow. Um, but that's concept that there's a relationship between beauty and democracy, about beauty and enjoyment, about beauty and quality of life. In terms of social responsibility, we've tried to run our studio, office, whatever we like to call it, Rogers, Rogers Turk Harbour, and partners, and much earlier than that as well, the many previous people I've had the pleasure to work with, and I have had a tremendous, been extremely fortunate, I've had some tremendous people I've worked with throughout my nearly 50 years. My first partner was uh, my wife and Norman Foster, and then his, his wife, and later on Renzo Piano, and now uh, Ivan Harbour and Graham Stirk, and the whole concept of teamwork. I don't believe architecture is something about an individual, it's about the relationship between individuals. It's what I will call teamwork. So our, we gave up, we as the office, gave up any form of ownership. We directors have no ownership, financial ownership, within our office. Um, we wrote a constitution, and we said we will do certain things to pay back the society that's given us the good luck of being what we are. So, for instance, our earnings are tied, the director's earnings, there are 10 directors, uh, are tied to the lowest paid architect um, and cannot be higher than eight times the lowest paid architect. The rest goes to charity or to real profit share. And every individual in the office has a piece of that profit share to give to recognized charities. So it's all about, in a sense, profit, charity, ownership, and so on. The idea is that we are fortunate, we have a duty, we need to respond to that duty. I'm, I can go on for hours, so I'll leave it. Also is what type of work we do. We do, don't do military work, we don't do certain work. Cho choices that we make, obviously, we don't have to make it. But we've lived pretty well. I have to quickly say, I don't want anybody to think, therefore we've, we haven't lived, yes, I don't have a private plane, but we have a pretty good life. <laughs> So coming back to cities, and which my point is that in a sense it's a civic role that I'm talking about. Coming back to cities, this is the urban age. In 1900, 10% of people lived in cities. In 2050, we expect 80% to be living in cities. We now know that the only sustainable form of living is in that city. There's a very interesting piece of research made both by the Sierra Club and by the uh, New York Land Institute, which shows that having, if you had a house, which is a really eco house, perfectly organized, beautifully closed, highly, highly insula insulated, in the countryside, or if you had a rotten old house in the, in the city, in terms of energy, the rotten old house in the city is more efficient than your house in your super eco type house in the countryside. That's because, of course, not only is the car rolled into that, and remember that a car is about a third of all CO2 that we're producing, but also all the things that go with it, because we have to build new schools, new hospitals, new everything else, most of which are empty when you go back into the center of our cities. So we're emptying up our cities in one sense, which is part of it, and we are creating new things that are great economic, uh, sustainable and great cost of sustainability. So the compact city is the only way forward if we believe, and I'll talk about it in a moment, that the world is on the brink of destroying itself. Not so much the world, mankind. 
This is all about cities, constellation of competing cities. I'm all for competing cities. But what's interesting again, and I see it more and more, is that there's very little difference about how we look at things, whether you are in Sydney, or whether you are in Sao Paulo, or whether you are in Copenhagen, or wherever you may be. These problems are being tending to be solved in the same way. Now, there are all sorts of political pressures, because nimbyism, because the car is a very easy way of, getting, of doing things, and so on. But basically, the same problems, if we believe as an economic, if we believe as a climate change crisis, is facing all the world. It's a, in a sense, it's a global problem, not a problem only about individual cities. So the compact city is compact and polycentric. It uses derelict land first. It's well connected, encouraging walking and public transport. It's multifunctional, live, work, leisure. It's socially inclusive for both poor and rich. Environmentally responsible and supportive of good design and just. Just is a big word, but if we don't get justice in terms of funds and wealth distribution, or whether it is in, in form of religious or other forms of extremism, whatever that ext political extremism, then, of course, no city works. So justice, which is a social side of it, as it as so, so is socially inclusive, is part of architecture in, the, in terms of city design. Pienza, I go for my summer holidays here, uh, or close to here, southern Tuscany. And I put this here because it's a very well compact, well designed compact city. It was an old medieval city, partly created by Pius III when he became, who came from this tiny village. But the point I want to make is a, a clear edge between the city and the farmland. And of course, the compact city is good for the city, but it's also good for the farmland. It's also good for the countryside, who the world wants to look, drive out of their city into further suburbia. I mean, you want to go into the countryside if you're going to get it. Now, you shouldn't drive. You should go by bus or public transport. But still, you should be going into the countryside. So I put this up as a model of a, of a, a, a compact city that works well with a beautiful piazza, a fantastic church, etc., and fantastic food. Um, suburbia. Now, I don't, I'm not suggesting for a moment that we should be demolishing suburbia, at least I'm not at this moment. So, um, but it does, and I've just written a few things down, a third of all CO2 is dependent of, of, from car dependency. A third of household costs is the car. The car discourages walking, cycling, and the meeting of people. After all, as I've said, what it is about are the meeting of people, but if you're in a car, it's like being in a armored car, an armored tank in a sense. You don't, there's really one person and you sure can't talk to anybody, maybe two. It's not a friendly place. On bicycles, yeah, you can get away with that. Anyhow, you have, after a while you get out of breath, so you talk to people. Um, but a car, nothing of that happens. It is literally, it's also about wealth, of course, because most of the world, um, not more than 50% of the people have cars. The other 50% just suffer. And they suffer the disadvantages without the ability to move. So it's also a class barrier. Cars are a class barrier. Anyhow, walking, cycling is healthy. And in a society where we're very concerned about health and obesity, that's also about creating cities where, which are designed so that you don't have to go by car. And as I mentioned before, suburbia or suburban sprawl erodes the countryside, which is exactly what we want, which is precious to us. Hmm. It's very important to retrofit suburbia. I mean, most of us. It doesn't matter whether we're in Australia or we're in Britain. Britain, the England has us the. Third densest thing, in terms of number of people per hectare, Britain is the third densest country in the world after Bangladesh. 
and then Holland, and then comes England, which is interesting. So English England overall in cities is very low density. But the point I'm making is it has very little countryside. So a vast number of people live in the suburbs. This is Croydon, a major hub, good public transport, good, tra good tra trains going to the south, reasonably good tram, and so on. Um, an area which is in serious social and economic problems. And this plan here shows the, uh, the plan of the Croydon area, one of the biggest, possibly the second biggest bor borough out of the centre of London. And if you look here, and obviously green is green, and brown is higher density, and if you look here, you say, well, the centre of the city must be somewhere around here. Not at all. The centre of the city is where it's white. It has the lowest centre the lowest density of the whole of Croydon. So the point I want to make, rather than think about another new town or sprawling out of towns, let's concentrate on building up, retrofitting our suburbs. It's hardly a suburb, but it's a sort of suburb. It's quite, this is actually an aerial view. We're at States, it's not your two-storey suburb, there's plenty of it around here. But it's also full of tarmac, full of, <coughs> excuse me, Tarmac, or I don't know what you call it here, but what, uh, macadam or roads, are a very large part of cities like this. Let me, for instance, say that Los Angeles, 65% of Los Angeles is roads. 65% of Los Angeles is roads. Um, I'm sure that Phoenix is probably worse. I haven't got the figure, but it's probably worse. And of course, you, that has also, not only does it have serious problems in terms of heat reflection and so on, but it also has serious problems with water and so on. Um, so, what I'm saying is, one of the things that we need to think about is not only how do we strengthen the city centres, which I do most have done most of my thinking about, but really we should also be thinking about where most people live, which is the suburbs. How do you create suburbs where you can, have, you can go and walk or cycle and get to the local shop, and you can see the doctor, and you haven't got a, a junior school, and all the things that go with a community so that you can actually walk to those places rather than have a, uh, everybody go by, by, uh, by bus, uh, sorry, by car. This is the anatomy sort of analysis. I chaired, well, it's called for Tony Blair, and my, my boss was Deputy Prime Minister John Prescott, um, the research done on the state of our cities towards, towards, uh, towards an urban renaissance. And we came up with about 110 recommendations. And I kept on being told by the government that we've done them all, but what they really meant is we've read them all, but they hadn't done them all, all 109 recommendations. But they did do quite a few of them, one of which was the building on Dunlick land. And that was probably the most critical one which they did. But what this is about is really looking at a, at a piece of city, just as an, an exercise. Um, this, is an, this, this one here on the left is an abstract. This is actually a piece of Manchester, East Manchester. And what it says is that at the top, at the top is the centre of the city, um, and then these are dis districts, and then you've got neighbourhoods. And so you've got a hierarchy here. Of actually, this is in, rather than in the city, this is city, town, village, hamlet. You can do exactly the same to a city um, as that, break it down into pieces. And in a way, it's like a body. It's a cellular structure. And you link those different places by public transport. The big line going through it is train, for instance. The big dense blue at the centre is the centre of the city. And you densify around public transport nodes. And you increase the density, which allows you not to, to, to have a clear urban edge and not to spread out from that area. This, applies, this is applied to Man East Manchester, the study we did very much the same thing, to look at the anatomy of the, of the city. I'm going to touch on a lot of different things, as you can see this evening. Um, this is really about, and you do a lot of wonderful research here, and I apologize to a lot, to a lot of architects, a lot of planners, and a lot of specialists who know more than I do about the different subjects. Anything I might be able to do is put them sometimes together. And this is very much about climate change and energy and the need to use clean energy. 
by renewable resources. And remembering that 75% of all pollution comes from cities. Obviously, wind power, biofuels, thermal, solar, tidal, hydro, waves, te and technology and biotechnology. A lot of good work, and I'm sure it's been done here, is also in technology. You know, the development of plants that can absorb CO2, the development of Princeton, of plants that have black leaves, because the black absorbs much better than green. I'm just using this as a the concept. It's not only what is, should we say, nature, but what we, mankind, can do to solve the problem. Now, the problem, you could argue the problem shouldn't exist, but it does exist. And therefore, one of the approaches has to be technological, as well as the use of renewable resources. This is a really critical period. We've probably gone beyond the tipping the stage. We are, we have successfully destabilized the world. Many of the wars that we're seeing in Africa, in the greatest poorest areas, Pakistan, and are much, are much to do with poverty, and much of that poverty comes out of climate change. Desertification, deforestation, lack of water, these are Poor, uh, due to poor uh, harvesting of our resources and to poverty. So the aim, and this is in, in, in this is in, uh, well actually it's in Europe, but the aim is to reduce CO2 by 80% by 2005, oh, 2050. Moving on from a sort of general introduction about the compact city, I'll talk a little bit about buildings and then even more and also about buildings and what, what most examples I'm going to show you, probably all the examples I'm going to show you, are by our practice and I say our practice includes all the consultants that we work together. This is the Welsh Parliament which is a very effective energy efficient building. Now people say oh look it's all glass but actually if that part is all, there's a sea here and you come out of it and all that is public domain. Let me see what it is. So you have the public domain, which is the ground, and then you sink down below, you're looking down, there look, people are looking down at Parliament in, at work, and that's below ground. Yes, light does come down from above. So the idea basically is to conserve energy. It's so cocooned within the earth, using sea, the sea to cool the building as well. As well. And then it's very much again about the meeting of people. It's usually that on a normal day, there are lots of nannies and children and mothers and fathers and so on with, and old people who are just enjoying looking down upon the parliamentarians which are making decisions about their lives. It's the right relationship, looking down. Changing very much direction, but also this is about a tower in New York. Um, 110 stories, um, competition, which we think we didn't win. Um, um, but what it's about, I suppose, is apart from form, which of course as an architect I'm very interested in, it's about mixed use. And what is exciting about this tower to me is that it's got a piece of everything. It's got retail for three stories, it's got, um, it's got offices, it's got residential, it's got a piece of university, all the way up, and it sort of falls off the top piece, which is very expensive apartments on the, on the, top, on the top area. Um, and that, of course, allows you not only to get a really good social mix, but also it allows you to uh, get an interesting form in relation to here, to Central Park. Less interesting in terms of form and so on, but the battle on Ground Zero, the Twin Towers, um, and we 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 are doing that one. Um, the only reason I tend to put there is that we've now been fighting over nearly ten years. And if I look at the amount of money spent in changing direction, just because no one wants to take responsibility, because no government wants to take responsibility, it is a tremendously sad and shame situation. Um, one could have built wonderful buildings here but one's always being reduced to the lowest common denominator. Having said that, Norman Foster's doing one, we're doing one. Um, it's a sort of, it's a modern, interesting mixed group, but it's been extremely difficult to work. Uh, 
I'm going to show you what I think is probably one of the lowest cost houses or buildings, dwellings that we've been involved in, and also perhaps the most expensive dwelling we've been involved with. This is a, this is a low cost housing made out of basically wood, um, which can be built in 24 hours. The panels themselves are made in 24 hours in the factory or can be made on site in a factory. And the house is erected in 24 hours. The kit of parts and you can always select whatever design you like. The little red things are about energy collecting and, and, this, and the collecting of wind and sun and so on. Now, let's see. This sort of gives you a quick... Now, this is, this is called... A, it was a competition to build this, what was called then a £60,000 house for a competition which was run by the government which we were one of the, one of the win winners. But what's interesting is it's not that difficult to actually do it. Um, it has high insulation. It has potentially the highest, it meets the highest energy conservation that we have in Britain. Actually, this, uh, it's six star. You've already got up to four, four star, but it's only because the client doesn't want to go beyond it. Housing is a critical problem. I mean, in England, we are so seriously short of housing that it's more than impossible in terms of cost for a single person to have a house. You have to have two, earn, two people earning to be able to afford somewhere to live, especially if you're looking at anywhere which is, which is uh, centralised. That's your... That's it. And this is the most expensive we've been involved with, about the, which is an overlooking Hyde Park. And I again put this here partly to say, yes, there's probably a market for both. We're not saying you shouldn't build things which are expensive. We're just saying there is a tremendous demand. Now, I'll come back to this, but the importance of affordable housing is critical. I'm surprised how little one builds, in, certainly in Sydney, in comparison with, I'm going to say, Europe. Um, I'll come back to this when we talk about London. But Ken Livingstone put a standard of 50% of all housing built by private developers has to have to be affordable. In fact, he didn't get big, we didn't get beyond 37%, but still that's more than 2 or 3%, which is what I believe the sort of figure you're looking at here. Talking about design for a moment, we very much believe that design is a language. It's like poetry, it's like music, it has a beat. It has a form, it has an aesthetic. It's what sort of, what gives us joy. This is a house for my parents, built in the 1960s. Um, and then what it says, the architecture transforms the ordinary by giving order, scale and beauty to space. It allows us to build dr our dreams and turn them into reality. And this in a sense is very much the language which we've de developed. It's a highly legible form. It's a simple portal, steel portal frame, glass at both ends, highly insulated panels from the refrigerating, refrigerator truck industry, triple glass, etc., and, the, and the, the garden sort of moves through the house. As you can see it here, uh, there's a little lodge, and the whole co concept of transparency and lightness. Is, and this you will see in many different ways in much of the work that we as a practice have done. So the language that we're talking about, the narrative we're trying to talk about, is light and transparent, it's about lightness. It's about legibility and order. It's about process of construction. We celebrate both technology, and technology has always been celebrated. All architecture was contemporary in its time. All architecture was modern in its time. You read about Wren, which I've been re lately reading for certain reasons, um, you know, and you realize that Wren sweated to get St. Paul's up. He spent 40 years getting St. Paul's up, got so fed up when he, was in his lot, when he was in his early 70s because it had been turned down so often by the fact that it was too modern that he put a wattle fence, 18 foot wattle fence around the site so nobody could see what he was doing behind the site. So things don't change. So I think I've mentioned most of those things. Lawyers of London. Again, this is partly a celebration of an amazing institution, and I'm all for celebrating, and architecture does celebrate, but you do have to have a reason to celebrate. 
It's also about the play of light and shadow. It's very much about flexibility. We're now working on the building on the right, which I'll show in a moment. The main concept was it's a simple rectangular building in a medieval street pattern. And the, and the extra space is taken up by the services. You can see it here. There's the standard plan. Totally free of columns, totally flexible. Could be tomorrow's university when insurance insurance goes up and down like all market. Anyway, in a way, insurance is about selling and buying. It's just like a fish market, which is just around the corner from here. Um, and, and by removing the mechanical services, which have short life, very important point I want to make, in other words, obviously, just like any engine, whether it's air conditioning, whether it's electronics, or whatever it may be, those have the short. This is really the warehouse for people where they work inside here, around a big atrium. This is a traditional Lloyds. They've had many, many buildings in 1760 when they started the first Lloyds was made. But there's no flexibility in that type of building. Also, you can change the parts without interfering with the center. Not that different from the first house I showed you. And that's how it sits in that environment. And also, because of Lloyds, because it's a medieval st street, you can't see it. It has no single facade. And so it, you get glimpses. And this is a typical glimpse. And here you can see this is the great atrium. And here you can see the juxtaposition of the service cores. So the functional reason is short-term parts are left on the outside. Aesthetically, it allows you the play of light and shadow on mass, which is what architecture is really about. It's the aesthetic of architecture. It's a play of light and shadow. Um, and so it allows you that, that dialogue between the pieces and the total. So the interior. And the importance is, again, celebrating the structure, the builder, the building and the builder. Pompidou, which was about uh, seven years before 1971 with Renzo, um, that was also about this is more about public. If uh, Lloyd's was a glorified British club, which it was in many ways, Lloyd's Insurance, um, then Pompidou was, we wanted to, when we did it, the concept was, in the first few lines of the competition was, a place for all people, all ages, all creeds. A meeting place across between the British Museum, culture, and New York Times Square, jazz, liveliness, and so on. So we wanted a people's place. We wanted to take culture. We want it. Doesn't mean that everybody should do it. To take culture off its pedestal, to become, make it public attractive. We examined, as I mentioned, the area around. We found no public space. And therefore, we created this great square, which is down here. And we continued this public domain, which is the square, all the way up the facade, so it's three-dimensional in the way that it, that it acts. Now it has main, the main part components, um, a wonderful library, 1971, a library was for books, by the time we opened it, a library was for information technology, it was electronic. Flexibility and change is part of the critical part. Also the museum, museum in, seven, in, in 1970 is very different to a museum in 2010, not least They've added a lot of parts and pieces. So the building is in constant change, in dynamic. It's also very much about finding a rhythm. In a way, we often say that a building, especially a contemporary building, is more like a robot than it is a Greek temple, because things have to be changeable. Of course, they have an aesthetic quality. It's the changeability that has the aesthetic quality. And the scale, the scale of man, the scale of the hand, can find it. Um, the skit is seen in the way that the pieces are put together. So the junctions and the pieces and so on gives a scale to the building. Whether this was a glass facade or a brick facade, it would be massive. It is at least full of light and shadow. It is pretty massive, but it is full of light and shadow. When we did the competition, we had hoped that we would be able to make the facade a dynamic facade. And we nearly did it. In other words, the idea was that we could use the facade itself as a communicator. You can see exactly what date. When you look at night, what that, at that building, though most of you are much too young, um, you know, this is very much an anti-Vietnam statement. And that was the period. Um, it basically was saying, you know, now, 
theoretically it was only about culture, so it was a hidden statement. But this is about the possibility of MoMA in New York communicating with Pompidou Center Beaubourg in Paris, communicating with wherever else you want in Holland and so on. So the facade becomes a dynamic way of reaching out to the public, all public, not just the intelligentsia. The building itself, it changed radically the area. The area was the poorest area in, pa in Paris. There is very much, very central. There's the Seine, um, plus Saint-Michel. Um, up, and this area was really running down. It created a, a, a pole where, which built up <coughs> where people came to and therefore people wanted to live again in this area. This is how it was when we came to it with a big car park. Um, the car park partially because there was a lot of TB and partially because some bright person thought the way of getting rid of prostitution was to demolish the buildings. Little did they think that the prostitutes were intelligent enough to move one street back. <laughs> um, and in a sense, uh, the point I'm making is the importance to us about the process of construction. It's where the detail comes out of. Understanding and working extremely closely with engineers, with our cons whatever consultants they are, to understand how you put these pieces together, how you drop these are beams, beams which are travel 48 meters across, dropping onto one of the brackets, and this is the end of one of the brackets, the detail of the brackets, the relationship between the hand, the leaf, and the scale, and so on. And that's the side on the mechanical side. So one side is the mechanical side, the other side is the people's side. So you don't, I mean, all offices tend to be with a central core. We hate central cores because it really means that there's no art in architecture, or very little art in architecture. Central cores being the lifts and the toilets and everything being in the center. That's a traditional building like that one here. Uh, this is actually uh, the plan of um, ground zero, and that's a very traditional building. building. That gives you the scale, of that's because the football pitch, and I just put it there because of scale. But what we're saying, you don't have to, because of course you have no flexibility. If you want to create a community in this space, if you want to change the way you use it, if you want it to be I know dwelling is a university tomorrow because things have changed. You can't. It's fixed forever. So what we're saying is, let's re-examine whether you can, what you can do. These are different buildings which we've built or are building. Transparency. So that, that was partly flexibility. This is about transparency, lightness. Again, it depends on climate. Yes, we have done buildings where, which are looking completely inwards because the climate is appalling on the outside, which are in themselves very interesting. And also skyline. And actually Lloyd's is very much about skyline. London had a great skyline, then we completely sort of created this sort of rectangular boxes in the post-war period. Now we're coming back to a skyline. But the skyline doesn't have to be a sort of looking back over one's shoulder to the 18th century. You can actually do it in modern terms. Building which is now going up at Leaden Hall opposite Lloyd's. There's Lloyd's on the left hand, you can just about see it there. Um, which is slopes back because there's a view, it's in the cone. London is very much controlled by view cones, and there's a view of St. Paul's down there, and therefore it has to step out of the view of St. Paul's, and to step out, we've pushed it backwards, and the uh, developer, British Land, has accepted the stepping backwards. And also, it ha we have been able to give, and we'll talk about a great atrium at the base of the public, there's a big public domain in that area. This is where the mechanical services are, this is where the toilets are, this is where, and you know, we use a lot of colour. Why do we use colour? Well, partly because we like it, but it's a way of creating happiness, a leisure, creating a tonality, giving us sort of, a, not only a colour, but a colour in mood. This is the entrance, this is the atrium, seven storey atrium, as tall as most of the buildings around here, which is very much a continuation of this small square. There's actually no glass in that atrium, so you can move straight from the square into that atrium. The spirit of travel, um, I'll move a bit faster, but really the idea is we spend hours in airports. I seem to spend a lot of time in airports. Uh, we now have to get there two hours before the airports, the, trip, the plane leaves. Can't we get some spirit out of it? After all, I have vivid memories of, uh, I don't know, in the 1960s and 50s, 
going to stations, especially in Paris, and seeing these amazing trains going off to Istanbul and so on. The, whole, the magic of travel was fantastic. That tends to have gone. So we've now built a few airports. This is the one in Madrid, Barajas, uh, which has been a tremendous enjoyment. But this is Central Station, oops, this is Central Station uh, in New York. Uh, and again, the, the excitement of being in that. So we try to capture some of that excitement. We all say it's very, very large. It's uh, 1.4 kilometers long, Terminal 1. We've done two terminals here. And so rather than have one color, we decided to have the color of the rainbow so that you could sort of say to your mate, we'll meet under the pink column rather than gate 66. <laughs> it's all prefabricated. It's, it's about the process of construction as well as about the space. Yep. And there you can see the concept of colour, looking down one of these long areas to try and lift the spirit. And that's bamboo, highly sustainable material, um, because it grows so fast. And now just to talk briefly about cities. Having talked a certain amount about the fundamentals of cities, I now will talk about some of the cities we've been working on, including at the end, we'll, I'll touch on Barangaroo. These are urban studies. I was a senior consultant for years on Barcelona, which is probably the most, the, the best city in terms of urban regeneration of the last 20 years. Now, it has a fantastic plan by Cedra, 19th century planner architect. And the port was completely derelict in the port area. The, nobody could, the, the city was completely cut off from the water. And Borigas, under Borigas's team, great urbanist and, and, and architect from uh, Barcelona, and three great mayors. They developed this whole site. Now, um, it has regenerated Barcelona, first of all, as the visitors and center, as a city itself. You can argue that it's too big, and this makes the point about spaces can be too big, but all the railway and all the road goes underneath here, so that's why there's such a distance. But it is a problem. Spaces can be too big. London, which I'll talk about in a moment, and Paris, which we're working on now for the, for the president. We've, he's approached a number of teams to look at Paris as a whole, nothing less than Paris. And this is New York, which we're looking at the East River. And then uh, Shanghai, I'll touch on Berlin, Florence, and Sydney. That's, and that's Barangaroo, slightly out of date, but basically correct. Shanghai, the first one which we did a big competition scheme, we were asked by the mayor to advise him, and he said, Pudong, an area across the river from the Bund, a wonderful area. This is the wonderful 19th century old offices and so on. This is a photograph taken when we started, probably 15 years ago now. And this is where the mayor wanted to build a city for a million people. We thought it was a daft idea, a city for a million people. I mean, we built new towns in Britain, for 30,000, that was a lot. Um, well, in fact, we never managed to get it built because they had built much more than a million. But anyhow, so we started working work on it. And our concept was, and there's again a lot to do with diagrams, it's about energy efficiency to reduce the amount of energy by a sixth in the city to create a public transportation system that really worked. And this is all about communications from the old city to the, to the, to the new city. Create six towns or six of 180,000 each more or less, this is a diagram, around a central park and everybody was there, either within seven minutes walk of the central park or seven minutes walk of the river park. Um, and everything was connected by a light railway system. I haven't got time to go through it in detail, but this in a sense stood by us and I've written many a book and made many a statement, but uh, this is very much at the heart of our thinking. What's so interesting here is that when I arrived in Shanghai, Shanghai had nine million people, seven million bicycles. And I said to the mayor, you've got seven million bicycles. Thinking, gosh, what a wonderful idea. And he said, turn around to me, completely misunderstanding what I was trying to say. Don't worry, I will ban bicycles by the end of the century. <laughs> Which in a sense, 
understandable. I mean, it reflects the importance of technology and what, the importance of the car, the American uh, car-based life. I say American, the world's car-based life. That was one rather amazing thing. He didn't ban bicycles. They sort of more just died because there was nowhere to, nowhere to cycle any longer. But what's even more interesting is that this city, which is 9 million, I had a few reasons why I decided not to come back for about 10 years. And I came back 10 years later, and the city of 9 million had grown into a city of 19 million. So Shanghai had added New York in 10 years to Shanghai, which gives you the scale of growth in, in China, in fact, in, the, in, in that part of the east. Of the east. I mean, it is quite amazing. Of course, pollution is fantastic, it's not very human, but construction and delivery is quite breathtaking. This sort of, again, shows more about of the, what I've been talking about, big park, the sort of six cities around the, the edge, um, the live, work, leisure mix. What it is today, which is nothing to do with what we were suggesting, where, we, where we're looking at cities for a million, but with nowhere you can cycle, you know where you can actually walk. But it does do some amazing things. I don't want to overbreathe, because it has managed to do things which nobody else has done. It built certainly more housing than any other country in the world. In the world. It has, certainly has a higher standard of living overall, and so on. So one must be careful about how one sees this. Berlin, central Berlin, I think I'm getting a bit late, so I won't go through it, but the concept here again was that Potsdamer Platz, two great piazzas, wonderful sort of uh, path over here, bring it through the center, create a pedestrian zone, and then buildings coming from the center to strengthen the city center, which is the center here, and bring the park through the center, which you can see here. This is, this is how it was after the war. In fact, when we arrived there in about 1970, it was very much like this, totally demolished. And this is actually what we built as part of that scheme which you just saw. Grand Prairie, the project we're heavily involved with now, um, the president, Sarkozy, asked 10 teams to, have, to look at Paris. There's this amazing tradition, in, as you will know, in France. Uh, everybody since Louis XIV was leaving their f fingerprint on Paris. Um, and of course Napoleon left all the housemen and uh, Pompidou left the Pompidou Center and Mitterrand, who I was a consultant for a long time to let me all these grand projets all around the place. So Sarkozy decided that he had to get up it. So his grand project is change the whole of Paris. <laughs> You have to admire the sort of courage and the concept. And actually, I have to say, when he talks, he's brilliant. Well, if he delivers, it's slightly different. Um, I won't go through this, but it's all about transport, transport. And what we did find out, which is an interesting figure, was when we looked at the number of cars and going through Paris, 70% of all the cars going through Paris didn't want to be in Paris. They wanted to go around Paris. So obviously, one of the key things was trying to start to look at how can you create a circular public transportation network with nodes and so on, rather than purely linear, which is what's happening now. There's the top one being the linear one, and then connecting that. And this is very much about trying to knit across the... Paris has these vast rail tracks, wonderful 19th century and 20th century. It has the best public transportation system possibly in the world. Um, and, uh, but it doesn't half tear the city up to, in pieces. And these are signs of it sort of tearing it to pieces. And what we've suggested is one of the ways to knit the, the physical society and the social society together is to start to look at how you can bridge the circular, the great circular road, the trainways and so on, which is, this is really a diagram, to start to see how can you minimize the impact of these massive intrusions into the city fabric. This is in slightly more detail. Um, this is one of the Gare de l'Est, uh, and this shows basically there's the great station over here. Actually, that's Gare de l'Est, that's Gare du Nord. No, it must be Gare du Nord, Gare de l'Est. 
and how you would start to look at parks and so on, how could you go over it. These are these big cuts into the texture of the city, which divides, of course, but also between poor and rich. This also starts to say, but be careful. I doubt whether cars will, will be with us in 25 years. I'll be surprised if cars are in their form that they are in 25 years. I just say be careful, because then we have to think, what are we going to do with those roads? What sort of cars can we invent which are not cars? Can we make, I mean, when we look at the mass, the size of the average car, I, I was just lately again in, in, in China, uh, and some of the, one of the big towns, they only allow, you, everybody's on a little moped and a little motorbike, but they're all electric, they will only use electric type. But what's happened, of course, the Chinese being highly creative, they've built little cars around their mopeds, they can get three people on it, with a little enclosure, and so on. That's creative thinking, I mean, in other words, it probably uses, 20% of what a normal car uses in space and probably uses the same amount in, in, in energy. So I don't think we're going to be with exactly the... There's a danger of thinking that the society we're with now will be with us forever. I hope it won't, but, and I also hope it will imp there will be great improvements. I say I hope it won't. I enjoy the society, but we have in, I think I've tried to show the sort of problems that we're facing. London, which I... The city I have been brought up in, I was actually born in Italy, um, with this great river and this amazing energy now, especially in the last 10 years. The influx of people from abroad and the fact that you can go abroad has changed London from a very isolated society where the only places you could meet people were either private clubs attended only by men or pubs attended only by men. <laughs> Now we have a society that's a bit more mixed because the French won't let us get away with it or the Italians won't let us get away with it. And so we've learned that you can actually have a very vital life. And so thanks to a much greater mix, London has improved. London was on its way down in 19... When I, we were building Lloyd's, Lloyd's and we were all discussing whether we should, they should move to Frankfurt. It's worth thinking about that. In the early 80s, we thought that probably the business world centre, the European centre, would be Frankfurt. Therefore, everybody was beginning to get ready to bail out of London. Today, you know, London is certainly competitive with, with New York, and that's much to do with the quality of life, the vitality that London has been able to offer, which is much to do with the open door policy, which we, now, we are now busily closing. Um, I wrote a, a big report uh, for Tony Blair, um, and that was then in uh, taken up by Ken Livingston, who asked me to be his chief advisor on architecture. And the key points, and I'll just read them out because they are key, uh, population increase of nearly a million, uh, whatever happens, it has to be on derelict land or intensification around public transportation. So maintain the green belt, don't build on green land. Um, it has been easy. The amount of green land, England has increased, not least by the number of people coming from abroad. Um, but we have as much derelict land today as we did when we did our first calculation, calculations 12 years ago, because it's always coming on, because lots, there's less industry, goes to China uh, or wherever else. Um, and as well, our cities are more compact. So we have piles of derelict land, so you need to stitch together the societies. There's nothing worse than living in an area, East Manchester, East Manchester had four out of five dwellings were derelict in the city itself. You can imagine what a fun it must have been living amongst those derelict buildings. Anybody could scrap a bit of money together, got out, and only the sick or the truly poor stayed there. So the whole idea of stitching together is critical, and London was probably the, uh, the lead country. All future construction to be on previously developed land, increased density around public transport hubs, 50% affordable housing adjacent to private development. Private developer, to build anything, had to basically guarantee an equivalent number of apartments as affordable. Affordable is about 75% social housing, 25% sort of young managers, young, uh, not, the not wealthy, but not, not down and out, should we say. Um, major public transport investment, bike hub, congestion tax, oh yes, congestion tax for entering the city. That's pretty, been pretty good, not least because it has reduced the number of cars and so on. It has reduced crime, by which is interesting. I haven't got time to go into it. But, um, but 
more, perhaps what is interesting is the money that we get out of congestion taxes is put into public transport, and that is critical. Um, development of public spaces, 6% reduction of CO2 by 2025. This is the master plan. Uh, plan in, I did in the 90, early 80s about the Thames. The Thames is the most wasted public space we have in Britain, the most beautiful river with some of the world's most ugly buildings all along it. The so one great success story has been the South Bank. It used to be a no-go area until about 1990. It's now where everybody goes on a weekend with their wonderful festivals um, of every type, Turkish or, Cot or from people from the Cotswolds, whatever it is, they have festivals all the way down here and some great cultural buildings like the Tate, the Globe, the Design Museum and of course the South Bank Cultural Centre. What this shows is that this was, I guess, 1980 about, and, to, and yellow marks activities, and today this is the South Bank, activities go all the way down here. So that's been a success story. East London, new city, looking at a new city, typical of London, this is where the Olympics are, all the old derelict ports. Uh, we will have a city here for 400,000 people um, near, uh, near Canary Wharf and near the Olympics. And that's how it is now, this is how it will be. And now just the last few words on Barangaroo. I think you know it all, but this basically is as it is. It's a great concrete sort of uh, aircraft carrier which is, with no function at all at the moment, uh, over a kilometre long. Um, right close to this amazingly beautiful area. And I keep on saying that, in my opinion, Sydney, especially from the water, but never in the Sydney CBD area, is arguably the most beautiful city I know anywhere in the world. In other words, because the sea comes right up to the buildings, because the, the sort of interrelation between... San Francisco steps back. It's got land and bays and so on. Beautiful city, great hills. Terrible weather, but great hills. Um, <laughs> Here it's got great weather. Um, you know, Barcelona is pretty good, but again, it's got it's nothing to compare with this. This is really Rio de Janeiro. Well, suburbs are even worse than here. No, much worse. Uh, uh, so this has got, and I think it's important because sometimes I feel that you, if I may say you, you don't appreciate what an amazing city it is. Um, so what I'm worth saying is, okay, so here's this concrete base. This amazing, lively business area over here, the integration of buildings and sea all the way around the edges. The concept is basically to create a park over half the area, um, and then a high density area over here, in directly linked to the business area back here. This is live, work, leisure. What we're looking at is the possibility of creating a f the fan, a fan of buildings, a cluster of buildings. And that's very much related to the fact that you've got a tube station, which I haven't got the right position, but let us say roughly there. And so it fans out from the metro, from your fast transport system, going out that way. And also allows you to not be a series of rectangular buildings uh, for no special reason at the right angles to the water, but actually to be a dynamic object. And so you start to get here. And of course, the views change. Because of that, you get much more dynamic views. So, if there's a hotel which is here, then you can start to open it up towards us. You can open it up to the views. So, and then the concept that this happens to be the red is the hotel, but we're also saying because of the <coughs> general mood, shall we say, we feel that probably would be better to be lower than the existing CBD area. In other words, the old area up on the hill and about around here is that. So our buildings are low, what we're suggesting are low. And it has a podium and an area below to bring it down to human scale, which is that area back here. So the buildings stand on top of the human scale. Now, much of this work has been done with my good friend Young Girls, um, you know, and it is very much about how you get different scales at different, at different heights. This starts to look at the buildings, how you see them and so on. Um, this is more, probably much more important in terms of it's more fixed. 
Um, and this is about the public domain. In other words, this is the ground area. So all the transport goes down here. Um, then this is all basically public domain. These are the three towers. And all the sort of area, the red area, are retail, two, three-story retail, out of which comes the office buildings. And then you have this cut, so you don't have this big concrete uh, element, which is the base, but now you start to have bays and water and canals being brought in. And live, work, leisure. And this is that base I was talking about. So there's a scale of, low scale, say around three stories, which is the sort of domestic scale, two, three, four stories. And out of this comes the which carries basically the taller buildings. This is all public domain, this is important, but you'll see more of it in a moment. This is all public domain, the only real car road is back there. This shows it probably rather well, in other words, this, to get two scales juxtaposition, getting a dialogue between the lower parts, which is this part, and it's quite complicated, this question, how you handle this, how do you, how do you get the scale? And then how do you get what you're going up to 40, 50 stories above it and still make it human? And how do you get the restaurants and so on to work at that lower scale? Now, these different scales, you know, we often say up to five or six stories, you can sort of shout down and say, Jimmy, don't jump into the water. Um, after six stories, if Jimmy jumps in the water, you're, you, he's at it. You can't shout, you can't communicate any longer. So there's a sort of clear scale. There's also a clear scale between heights of trees, which are around that four to eight stories, probably. And then you're getting to another scale, very exciting scale, but it's, but it's a, different, a different scale. And how you handle those scales and how you handle it both in the process of construction and a, and a process of communication, which is what we're trying to say. Buildings read. You read a building just like you read a poem or, read, or you hear music. You hear the beat, you infill the pieces. It depends how much freedom you give, but you can do you, you, you can put it together so that at the end of the day, if it's successful, it lifts the spirit, but it's also highly legible about how it was done. That's what I'm talking about in the sense of the lower area, this is the base area. I won't go, that's all housing, hotels and so on. Um, and then the tall buildings, which you can see much more clearly here. Um, this is, again is an old drawing, but it shows it a bit easy, more easily along here. I realize that you can't see it very well. Um, and that is the main, the main, the hotel, and these are the office towers, residential, and so on. And as you see, within the overall, this is very much part of the CBD area. In other words, it's in the same tonality as the CBD area in this area. Remembering that, I keep on speaking about densification, that if you don't densify, then there is a lack of vitality, and also the tendency is to sprawl. Densification is the sustainable process, is a sustainable process. Right, coming to the end, a sort of quick look at what we've been talking about. Some of the principles. Intensification of existing s settlements on derelict land. That's exactly what we're talking about on Barangaroo. Intensify buildings around public transport. We need more public transport. Quality of design of public open spaces and buildings, we've been talking about that. Encourage walking, cycling, and public transport. Re reduce greenhouse gases by 80% by 2050. That's a sort of, it's more as a global concept that we must do that to have any chance. We've already gone over the edge. We're already, we've already, the tipping has started. The world will never be the same again. I want to say that clearly. The world will never be the same again. We are already destroying the world that we live in. Um, recognizing that wealth distribution, climate change, and the quality of built environment are critical issues. Those are, and then last one, which has nothing to do with the rest, but as I'm in a school of architecture and a university, I thought I'd put in, which basically says, combine architecture, planning, and landscape architecture into a single degree. And I don't understand why medicine does it rather successfully. In other words, you do three years of general medicine, and then you, or five years of medicine is much longer, but in principle you do a base course, 
Um, and then you specialize, whether you're an anesthetist or whatever else you, are, you may be. Um, in our, we as the don't link up the group that we all work together. We don't work, I mean, as a planners only work in two dimensions, but planning is all about three dimensions. Architects have very little understanding about la land use, just to take examples. Or the econo econo economics of land use and develop and land. Le Engineers work in their little boxes, we all do. Landscape architects in there. Surely landscape architects is a continuation of urban regeneration that, that we're all talking about. So I would strongly recommend, and have been for unsuccessful for some time, saying maybe we should restructure the built environment educational system. That might give architecture a, more, a stronger foothold. What, I mean, we as a profession, whilst I do believe, a slightly biased view, do a valuable piece of work, we are our own worst enemy. Thank you very much. relationship to some of your clients. You've been lucky enough to work with, with politicians as your clients, Sarkozy and Mitterrand and Livingston. What do you do when a politician is running and is saying to you something completely contrary to the remarks that you're making tonight? Is actually looking for not to intensify the derelict land, is in fact wanting to turn it into a park. Um, is, is trying to run counter to the principles that you're espousing. Do you find that in the current climate that politicians are actually having too much say? I mean, it's a step by step. Obviously, the problem is about lectures as they condense to five for 50 years or whatever. Um, you know, I suppose if I look back, and I'm not, I don't want to, you know, I know my way, which is like there must be a million ways. But I started a long time ago, beginning to put little pieces together. I, you know, I did the wreath lectures, which are perhaps the sort of the lectures which are most well known in Britain uh, on on cities. Um, uh, I did exhibitions on cities. I ran in what was called the London Architectural Foundation. Can't even remember. Um, I say I. You know, I had friends like Ricky Burdett, um, who probably is the person who should really be here, who knows certainly more than I do now about cities and the global, global cities. I work with the young girls. So it's not quite a situation where you go to a client and says, and you say, this is what I want. You're going through steps, because obviously, the, let's say, the developer, or more the politicians even, is going to say, well, I won't be voted in again if you are telling me that I am to ban the car. But you do point out the problems, because if you don't, I'm using ban a car again as a sort of, but if you don't control the car. But then you can point out that there are successful stories. And what's interesting is many of them are not just in the wealthy world, but in the third world, for instance. And if you're lucky, you might be able to persuade the politician to go to see Curitiba in Brazil. Or as I said, Barcelona, we all went, or Holland. We're very fortunate, we have Holland right next door to us. They're much more responsible than most countries. Not least because Holland dug the earth with their hands out of the sea. So they have a value. I would say they have a value. They give them a value to the land. But the fact that they're always in danger of being flooded. But so they, they have a strategy deeply rooted in that, as well as a deeply rooted social responsibility strategy. It's not all good news, but it sort of starts. So I suppose you do it step by step. But it's no different with a client. I mean, uh, you win some, you lose some. Clearly. You have good clients. We have a very good client in the situation of uh, Baranguru. But we do have open discussions with the client, as they do. You know, it's a two-way system. Um, and that goes for all political and, uh, situations. I don't think it's one of the question of if you don't do this, you're finished. You have to sort of do it piece by piece. And by the way, you are changing. There are beginning to be public transport systems going through the city, which never existed before. So, some warehouses have been saved. Just to take an example, the first time I came here, I was brought in 
by people to argue for conservation. Um, so, bit by bit, there's some victories. Whether it's enough, I don't know. Um, but you can look at examples which are successful, and I think that's the most useful thing you can grab. And occasionally you meet amazing politicians who really have a vision. Ken Livingston was probably one. John Prescott was... I worked for some of the most difficult politicians, in my opinion. Uh, John Prescott was known for having a tremendous chip on his shoulder, but I love working because he was passionate about the, the built environment. Deputy Prime Minister. Any others? Gosh, what a silent group. Uh, Lord Rogers, I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on the um, work that has come out of the Grand Paris project that you've done in Paris. The, um, your particular contribution now with respect to the other ten teams that were involved. Well, I suppose it's two. We've now been given an area around Bercy, which is where every train... When I look there, I think every train in the world goes through there. But anyhow, it's a massive railway tracks um, just to the south of the centre of Paris. So we're looking at it in greater detail at whether we can bring some of these concepts we're doing with Jean Nouvel, and we're looking to see what we can do. Now, that might be, I say might, it's a long way from, be a physical delivery of a concept. We are also running sort of a studio with the government, for the government, I know, um, where people can come and discuss, and mayor specifically. Now, interesting enough, Paris is one of the first things we discovered about Paris, and I'm sure that every Frenchman, first of all, every Parisian knew it, is what we call Paris is actually 17 arrondissements. So it's just the centre of Paris. There are actually 1,200 mayors in Paris, plus one which we all know about, which runs the centre of Paris. The 1,200 other mayors there's no body that links any of them together. So they, of course there's no coherent policy. So one of the things we've been saying is there's got to be some link between the mind and the limbs, you know, I mean, in Paris. So that's a political thing. Now, will we be successful? Of course, the president loves this. And the mayor quite likes this, but the small mayors of the 1,200 hates it. Where we'll end up, I don't know. But it's sort of, it's a good, interesting discussion. So the point I'm trying to make is it's a sort of um, we're making, I don't know about headways, but we're, we're disturbing the waters. We're stirring it up, I suppose, is the way to put it. And we're getting something out of it. Whether we'll go ahead with this, I'm not optimistic in any detailed sense. But it's certainly, I mean, a lot of this, including Shanghai, has been extremely good for our own knowledge. I and mean, I think a lot of the stuff, people say, why do you do competitions, which we seem to do, though I keep on saying we won't. Um, and the answer is, I suppose, yes, we lose lots, and I suppose we store the knowledge, and we store the knowledge for the next time, and we store the knowledge for the next time, and that's all we can do. I might, uh, take, uh, I might take the opportunity to um, um, close the evening by inviting uh, Professor Ken Ma to um, say a few words and thank, thank Richard. Ken is uh, the executive chairman of Hassels, uh, Australia's largest and international multidisciplinary design practice, one I think that uh, you would support, combining landscape planning of design and He is also active as a, a professor of design in practice in our faculty, um, has been very influential in setting environmental and urban design policies for the Australian Institute of Architects, and also initiated high-level summits for reviewing city design and urban strategy issues. And he's also, of course, uh, one of Australia's gold medalists. So I might invite Ken to close the evening. Um, thank you, Alec. Um, look, it's a great pleasure, of course, to thank Richard Rogers for such clear insights uh, and inspiring talk on, on cities and, uh, importantly, architecture and landscape architecture, the things that are important to the future of our cities. Now, my, this has been the first opportunity I've had to meet Richard Rogers, and my contact with him previously is rather vicarious because uh, many, many years ago I entered the Pompidou competition and came, what I'd say, as a distant equal second <laughs> with a few of my colleagues, young graduates from the University of New South Wales here. And of course, from that time on, I've had a huge admiration for his, his work. 
Uh, there was some vague similarity conceptually between our schemes, but that's where it stopped. And uh, uh, Paris has um, uh, benefited enormously by his kind of bold intervention with, Rich, with, with his colleagues. Um, but, it, but it's certainly been a great privilege, I think, to hear um, not only from an internationally significant architect uh, with a very distinguished body of work, um, a, a work that's bold, clear, authentic and consistent, uh, but work also of our time. And I think there are great lessons in that, particularly at a time where some of our architecture is struggling in the sense of understanding its place and its time. Um, but, but also, I think, you know, Richard's been a great urbanist, and um, pre-climate change, pre all the current interest in uh, environmental issues has been strongly committed to more effective, more sustainable cities. Um, and, you know, I, I think I got really interested in his writing and just those wonderful accessible books like uh, Cities for a Small Planet. And then later, uh, the report that Richard referred to, um, which is quite a seminal document uh, towards urban renaissance. And while I think it was very ambitious in its, in its ch charter, it has led to real change. And I had the, the pleasure just a few weeks ago of being in London and seeing a city which is much more vital than I think it had been in the last time I visited five years earlier. Um, I also actually went uh, on a recent uh, visit um, to Wales and saw the National Assembly building, which I think is, a, is, is just such a wonderful kind of humble building, yet uh, profound. Um, so, in a sense, we need Richard Rogers. We need people who, who talk so passionately about our future of our cities, but also talk to our politicians about such issues and are heard by our politicians. Um, because I, I think it's the humanity that's at the heart of his thinking, which is so critical to his credibility in this area. Um, you know, issues of civic realm and public life of uh, transformation and what cities can do to us. I mean, I'm reminded of a talk many years ago I heard from Charles Correa, who, who so eloquently talked about the value of the cities, and he talked about it in terms of sort of blue spots and red spots. He said, you know, a village might be all blue spots, and then as the village grows, there are a few red dots in terms of the people involved in the village, and then as that grows, there are red, yellow, blue, etc. And then you get the kind of rich life that comes with a city, and I think um, Richard's message is, uh, is very similar. How, how, and how do we understand these great cities of the past to inform our future? Because I think um, Richard is very much um, about the future, um, about how we now transform these remnant parts of our cities into something so vital and so interesting. So it was amazing breadth of projects, um, modest and extravagant, um, housing and cities, um, and, it, and it's just sort of a, a, a wonderful thing to see, see such a range of influences and opportunities that, that a practitioner with Richard and, and his partners have. Um, I, I think um, there's definitely a hidden dimension to sustainability in this talk because we talk often about you know, star ratings and energy production and buildings, all of which are important. But Richard talks about how buildings can be universal, how they can be celebrating of life, and how they can be flexible. I think you use the term how buildings can be built. Um, and I would call it industrial craft with delight. So um, much to learn, much to appreciate. We've had great privilege tonight in hearing um, words of, as I said, inspiration and humanity from Richard. I think he's a collaborative master. And um, I think he combines a sort of um, articulate English quality with uh, an Italian sensibility. It's all about feeling. So please join me in thanking sincerely Richard. <laughs>